apologize. The recording actually was not going, so I've just started the recording. <laughs> Thank you. Um, she is responsible for leading and supporting student success initiatives system-wide. Dr. Karoff is, Karoff is the primary architect of the UT System Student Success Framework, which is focused on student financial well-being, effective advising, and deepening students' sense of academic and social belonging. She leads the UT System's Momentum Building Strategy on OER and also chairs the equity work group of Doers 3, the focus of our session today, the Driving OER Sustainability for Student Success Collaborative. And then also joining us today as a speaker is Dr. Clarinda Phillips, who is the Provost and Vice President for Academic Affairs and a Professor of Sociology at Texas A&M University, Corpus Christi. Prior to joining TAMU-CC, she served as the Provost at Notre Dame of Maryland University and in several positions at Moorhead State University, including Associate Vice President of Academic Affairs, Director of the Interdisciplinary Women's Studies Program, and Department Chair of Sociology, Social Work, and Criminology. Her teaching and research have focused on the intersectionality of race, gender, and class, and the sociology of mental health. Dr. Karoff and Dr. Phillips, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Judith. And we wanna thank everyone for joining us today. Um, we thank you for coming to and listening and helping us uh, do our work better. So today's session is entitled the OER Equity Blueprint, Work from the Driving OER Sustainability for Student Success Collaborative, or as we know it, Doers 3. And if I could just start off by saying one thing uh, in particular is that when I met uh, Rebecca about a year and a half ago, I walked into a room and I was a complete OER no novice. I mean, I knew what OER stood for, um, but on my own campus and on my previous campus in Maryland, we weren't really engaging in this work. And so I found myself after being in a room full of people who were, had been committed to this work for several years, some more than a decade, um, that I, I believe that we were really missing out. And for the preservation of my own ego, I thought if my campus is missing out in terms of uh, in improving equity outcomes, then other campuses uh, we're probably missing out as well. So uh, I continue to be committed to this work. I want us to help uh, higher education in general uh, do better with uh, equity, equity outcomes, and OER is a pathway to do that. So I'll just uh, say that as sort of introductory comments. So when we think, so just um, this session gives sort of a, a very brief overview of the work of Doers 3. We'll spend most of our time talking about uh, the work that comes from the equity work group. And that includes um, a rubric, but the session outcomes are focused on sort of having a deeper engagement with the equity dimensions of OER and also um, an introductory application of the equity through OER rubric uh, to participants, institutions, and context. While we'll do some uh, general sort of theoretical background, we want you to walk away from this session having the opportunity to think about what it would mean to apply uh, an OER equity rubric in your context. I should say that uh, the uh, equity blueprint, um, uh, the Doers 3 OER equity blueprint will be published in the next few months through the University of Texas at Arlington's Mavs Open Press. And so there is much more to come. This is just a taste to get you interested. And I think uh, when you see the final product in a couple of months, you will join with us in, in, in higher ed and we can move forward as a collective in terms of achieving equity on our campuses for our students by using OER. And Rebecca, I invite you to jump in at any time. No, it's all good. And I'm actually, I love that you said we're going to have this out and published in two months. That might be, we, we hope to. <laughs> I said I a few we, months. I, I know. I think we can meet that timeline. Yes. Excellent. Thank you. Um, 
So for us, it is important to know who is with us. If if you haven't already identified yourself uh, in the in the chat feature, if you just let us know who you are, your title, your institution or organization um, that you are with. Um, not only does it will it help us in terms of uh, follow up, but it also helps us to know who's with us today. I know I have some friends in the room in this session, and so I want to thank all my friends for showing up. Dean of Libraries, UTSA, Dean. Yeah, I too am seeing some friends here. It's wonderful to have you. And I love that we have some novices, so-called so novices to OER like Clorinda. I, I did not, I wasn't sort of born native OER. Um, I came to this through the student success work that I do in the University of Texas system. So, um, and I, in some ways I've learned so much of what I know from library folks in particular, like my colleague, Dean Hendricks at UT San Antonio. And, um, and we've discovered Clorinda and I would through the collaborative and national community for doing this work. Wonderful, looking at all sorts of different community colleges and universities, that's what we want. We know the community colleges in some ways are way ahead of the, the universities in this work. Some of the universities, I don't wanna insult any of my UT system colleagues. Should we move along then, Clorinda? Please. So next slide, and um, so let me tell you a little bit about um, the Doers Co Three Collaborative. It was, it's sort of an unusual kind of collaborative. On the other hand, um, we see other organizations like this working um, on OER around the country. The regional compacts are now very engaged in OER work, uh, entities like WICHE and um, MHEC or MHEC and the New England um, Compact. Also, Arlo is another group and some of the community college work that is also taking place. But Doers was launched in uh, the fall of 2018, and it was really kind of spearheaded by three university systems, the University System of Maryland, SUNY, and CUNY. Um, and some of you know that SUNY and CUNY have been the beneficiaries of like millions and millions of dollars from their state legislature dedicated towards OER engagement and expansion. And it's had, of course, this incredibly powerful impact um, so in any case, the three systems out east got together and said, you know, let's let's sort of let's join forces. They're, the system, the role of systems in some of this work can be so much more powerful to drive change and scale up change because systems serve lots of students. Um, so this is a collaborative of public higher education systems in the states, but also we've had some Canadian partners, BC campus. Um, and others. And so the province-wide efforts in, in Canada were just natural partners for this, this kind of collaborative um, systemic approach to OER, focused on student success. So we are focused on sustaining OER efforts to achieve equity and student success at scale. And we do coordinate with other nationwide efforts. Um, some of those are listed there uh, below. So um, there is a link to the statement of purpose if you'd like to see it. And, and for some of you, you know, this might be an opportunity to, to join doers depending on what your purchase and our emails are at the end of this presentation and we invite you to reach out for, with interest. I'll also note that our moderator, Judith um, Sebasta is dig, through Digitex, her fabulous organization, she is now joining the doers collaborative. Uh, next slide. So here you get a sense of, I don't, I don't even know how, how accurate this map is right now because the membership keeps evolving. But at the moment we represent uh, about 25 systems or initiatives you can see um, in the US and in Canada. We have 688 colleges and universities and over 6 million students served by those colleges and universities. So it gives you a sense of like the reach and potential impact for some of the work that we're doing. Next slide. And just to give you a high level um, overview of the doers work that we're, we've been engaged in, um, there's three work groups. 
Clarinda and I are on the equity work group, but there's a research work group and a capacity building work group. And they're producing some equally phenomenal work. Um, there's a really nice landscape analysis coming out of the research work group. I'm not quite sure, like, like our work, everyone's doing this sort of like, we all have big day jobs. So we sort of get this work done when we can. And we've had a slower rollout for some of the pieces, including our equity work, but, but it's all coming out probably within the next few months. But um, there's also some look, the research work group is looking into data standards for OER and actually moving forward, we're kind of finishing up some phase one projects. In phase two, we're gonna really try to establish that research agenda. Um, and I think the equity work that we're doing will be a, a critical component of that and in ways that I think will become clear. The capacity building work group has just issued some um, some tenure and promotion guide, policy and guidance for faculty members who are go, would like to include OER in their um, promotion materials. And this this is actually in a session I was doing yesterday. We had a good link to an article. I'll try to get it in this chat. Um, in, a, in when I'm not speaking actually, <laughs> um, but that that's like for those of us trying to figure out how we um, change some of the reward system at our institutions. This is some phenomenal guidance It's it's that I, I really am very excited about. There's also phenomenal work um, with bookstores and, and campus listings and fulfillment for course materials. We know this is another area that we're grappling with. And finally, there's the equity work group. Um, and our job, our task has been to create a blueprint on the role of um, OER in closing equity gaps. Next slide. And in some ways, I used we use the Dean Hendricks and I used this slide yesterday in our our presentation. But it, it really bears repeating. Like, why do we need an equity blueprint? Well, here's some good reasons. We have the pandemic. We have um, Black Lives Matter and the nation's sort of belated again reckoning with racial justice and inequities. Um, and we have this really very exciting move towards open, open education, open science, open data. Um, and this is, this is like, in some ways we're just, the time is so right for activity and movement um, in this direction to really think much more intentionally about equity and OER. So we're, we're pretty feeling pretty um, good about seizing the moment taking us further as Corinda and I will start digging into the actual work in the blueprint in ways that I think you can see we're really trying to do some unpacking around equity. Uh, next slide, Corinda, I'll turn it over to you. So I, I first must acknowledge other members of the equity uh, work group. So we have members, of course, from the two, uh, from two Texas university systems. We also have uh, representatives from CUNY, the University System of Georgia, uh, the university system in New Hampshire. We also have a member from the Colorado Community College System and the Massachusetts Department of uh, Higher Education um, in this work group. So it is a very diverse work group uh, with both state agencies, um, community colleges, um, so systems, as well as uh, um, even campus and individual campus representation. And so in doing this work, we wanted to make sure that, you know, what comes out of this work group is applicable to um, a variety of users in their um, context. And so uh, we, we spend quite a bit of time thinking about, okay, what does this look like, you know, from a system perspective? And what does this look like um, from sort of a, an individual university perspective? And then also in, in a sort of a community college context. So one of the reasons why we're spending time uh, or more time than I think we anticipated doing this work is because uh, the conversations have been rich. And we wanted to make sure that, that this is as inclusive um, and as applicable as possible. So um, in, in recognition uh, that equity uh, requires intentionality of purpose and action, um, the Doers Three um, Equity Work Group um, has committed to developing a blueprint. And uh, this blueprint is uh, designed to identify and identify the equity dimensions of higher education engagement with OER and place OER as a primary strategy um, to close equity gaps. Um, in other words, uh, we started with the implicit understanding that achieving equity lies at the heart of OER. 
Um, therefore, Doers 3 wanted to assist higher education institutions to deepen our engagement by defining equity and unpacking its dimensions in an OER context. So the, the OER equity blueprint has an overarching goal. And that overarching goal is that uh, we wanna define, unpack and explain the multiple dimensions of equity and foreground the role of OER in closing equity gaps. Uh, the equity uh, blueprint has the key components of a theoretical and research foundation, uh, the rubric, which we'll discuss and case studies. So for the Blueprint Foundation, we talk about what is an OER uh, equity blueprint, right? And the blueprint, our hope with the blueprint is that it actually frames and helps build out OER in our respective context. And that by having a frame upon which we can build out, uh, we will actually have an, um, a significant impact on uh, student learning and reducing equity uh, gaps. Um, in addition, uh, what we hope to accomplish is that by elevating the multiple dimensions of equity, uh, we will identify the roles and responsibilities of institutional players and propose levels of engagement, action, and assessment designed to aid OER in fulfilling their promise. So there's this the sense that we all have a role to play. And in order to figure out um, what role we have to play in advancing OER um, to improve uh, equity outcomes, we thought it was important to identify those players and list out ways in which those various players um, could intentionally act um, to create a better learning environment for students. We all know that higher education is not getting any more affordable. Matter of fact, it's becoming more expensive. And if we're if we're using OER, then what should come out of that, right, is that we reduce equity gaps. So we, we do have a, a, a theoretical foundation in the blueprint, um, which acknowledges the scholars and academic leaders that have uh, promoted equity and social justice as essential to the P20 mission, right? So we, as I say, we stand on the shoulders of those that have come before us and have really done the work to lay a theoretical foundation. For example, Latson Billings reminds us that students, cognitive, cultural, and interdisciplinary diversity should be included in any understanding of equity. The inclusive excellence work by AACNU insists that we uncover inequities in student success, identify effective educational practice, and build those practices for sustained institutional change. Sarah Lambert calls us to use OER for redistributive, redistributive recognitive, and representational justice. In other words, we must act and we must act to help others to ensure that marginalized and minoritized groups have access to post-secondary learning and the degrees that result from that learning. It is also the case when it comes to, let me, let me back up, sorry. Um, when, so that's, so if I talk about sort of the values um, that guide this, this work, um, one of the things that we point to is that um, OER should be learner-centered, right? We, uh, as you often hear, uh, we teach students, we don't teach content, right? So OER should be learner-centered so that it promotes equity, inclusion, and accessibility. Uh, another value that we hold is that recognizing inequities and working to uh, redress them requires responsibility that is both professional and personal. We also, uh, we also hold the value that equity and quality 
are constituent components of one another, meaning you can't have equity without quality and you can't have quality without equity. Equity, they are interdependent, but we'll have a little bit more on that uh, in a few, uh, few minutes. And then our fourth value uh, in this work is that achieving equity results um, results in increased student success in terms of access, participation, persistence, completion, and entry uh, into the workforce. Uh, we, we spent quite a bit of time uh, wrestling with definitions. So I'll just give you a few of those. I know I'm throwing lots of words at you. I will remind you that uh, the blueprint is going to be published and uh, this uh, presentation will be available for you um, after the session. So in terms of definitions, uh, we, we, want, we defined equity as a corrective process. As a corrective process, Equity demands fairness for marginalized and minoritized populations by reducing opportunity and achievement gaps through system, systematic efforts, through systematic efforts. So we believe you, once you define equity, you can measure it and you can measure it in terms of access to, participation in, persistence through, uh, completion of quality educational programs across student populations. And we mean that, so, we wanna do that so that we can disaggregate um, outcomes by race, ethnicity, gender, income, ability, first generation, and geography. And there are many other characteristics that we should be examining to ensure that our, our outcomes are equitable across various groups. Uh, we couldn't do this work without Ben Simone's um, uh, definition of equity mindedness. Uh, she has uh, not, not been officially part of this group, uh, but uh, she continues to uh, sort of spur us forward. And, and, you know, according to Ben Simone, equity mindedness refers to the perspective or mode of thinking exhibited by practitioners that call attention to patterns of inequity in student outcomes where we take responsibility for the success of our students. Many of you are aware of the sort of the, the research that has gone on in this area. Um, it, is, it, is be, it is emerging in some ways, uh, in, in other ways it has become um, sort of part and parcel of uh, moving any OER initiative forward. And so we acknowledge the work that has happened um, within our various, uh, across the US, but also outside of the US, right? I mean, it's with Sarah Lambert or others. And so there is this emerging uh, research on the impact of OER in closing equity gaps, uh, deepening student learning and improving, and improving student success outcomes. You, uh, we point to studies in, our, in the blueprint, we point to studies uh, by the University of Georgia, on how the use of OER decreased DFW rates uh, for Pell eligible students. And we also, of course, uh, point to the Achieving the Dream study, uh, which found that OER uh, increased course completion rates, improved learning experiences, and made college more affordable. So, so with that, I mean, I think we've talked, I've talked at you at least um, uh, quite a bit. And so we wanna have some time for discussion. Um, it looks like we have uh, roughly 40 or so participants in the session. So um, we will try to use the chat function um, initially, and, and but we wanna have some discussion and there may be a time where we can uh, actually uh, 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 unmute you or, or have a, a conversation around these questions. And so using the chat function, um, how are you engaging equity in your OER work from your role or sphere of influence. You can also use the raise your hand mode in the chat if that, I think there is one. Yeah. Uh, actually, maybe, maybe, oh yeah, there is one, yeah. And Rebecca and Clorinda, just let me know if you'd like me to um, let folks unmute themselves. 
we would ask that if we do that, if we would ask that everyone stay on mute unless you have something to say, but let me know if you want me to um, enable that feature. Thank you, Judith. Yeah, no, I'm hoping we get a few comments in the chat. Really for any of these particular questions that are up on the slide, um, you know, maybe ways you would like to be engaging equity more in your work that you're not, um, or some of the challenges and opportunities you, you see to really dig more deeply into the equity um, aspects of, of OER work. And Rebecca, I, I failed to, if I can just go back, I'm sorry, I felt I was, I felt, I didn't want to take too much time um, discussing the particulars because I do want to get to more of the application. Um, but we, the case studies um, that we have included in the blueprint so far include affordable learning, Georgia and accessibility, BC campus and accessibility, and the Ohio State University's racial justice grant program. If you have a case study that you would like included in this blueprint, it is not too late. And as Rebecca put in the chat, um, you can just email us. Uh, our email um, addresses are at the end of the presentation. We would love to include the work you're doing in our blueprint. Okay, we have a shy group of participants here and that's okay. Um, I'm gonna give, I mean, we, we can maybe, Okay, good. A question from Evelyn Bur Burgess to everyone. Do we want to unmute Evelyn or unless she wants to type it in the chat? Are you able to unmute her, Judith? It might be harder than it seems. I'm not sure, it's not, for some reason, it's not letting me unmute her specifically. Um, but I can go ahead and just unmute everyone for the moment and. Evelyn, you should be able to unmute yourself now. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay, uh, first of all, I'm new to OER. Um, so I haven't implemented, I teach in the business department. And um, I went through a training with Nathan Smith. And what I found is that for business courses, there aren't a lot of OER resources. So that's, that's something that then I can contribute to. <clears throat> but one of the questions that I have is when you're talking about equity, okay, we have students that have limited <laughs> to um, broadband and uh, Wi-Fi. And so a book is expensive. However, they can take it anywhere with them, you know, and I'm one of these, I like to have, you know, like right now, I'm, you know, book in hand uh, for my classes. So um, with OER, unless they had a printer that they can print, you know, in, um, materials that are assigned to them, um, I'm sorry, basically they have to have dependable computer or iPhone or iPad to then be able to access and then do the work. So how does OER address that? I know that for my business students that I have and they have issues with, um, you know, Wi-Fi, uh, Comcast had um, provided a service years ago, I'm not sure if they still do, where for $150 they can buy uh, a computer and then the uh, cost for the internet connection was $10 a month. And um, I think AT&T does that. So how does OER then, you know, address th that challenge? Great question, Evelyn. And it actually, this is, this is something that our um, OER blueprint and our rubric in particular addresses that you've got to ask questions. If you're talking about accessibility to OER, there's many dimensions of accessibility. One of them is the digital accessibility and COVID has of course, you know, underscored for all of us the extent to which the digital divide occurs on multiple fronts. There's the devices, there's the service, there's the Wi-Fi issue. So, um, but with OER, and this is something that um, others in this group will be able to answer even better, but most bookstores will make a print 
version of o the OER available to students for very minimal costs. Now, this is actually, I shouldn't say most bookstores, this is actually kind of an area where work is being done to help bookstores understand what might happen. Libraries too are playing a role here. I don't know if anyone, I, I, I'd love to hear from others who are actually working in this space on a campus, um, perhaps, um, to, you know, put, put in the chat and I see there's a comment coming through. So it does seem that, um, you know, I think there's there are ways to, ensure that your students have it. What this work, this blueprint and the rubric we're gonna show you a little snapshot of soon really helps you at least ask all the questions you need to ask, make those, those materials available to your students. It's, it's a complex environment. Um, and in some ways I think we, we need to, what this project is seeking to do is really think of, help people think more comprehensively about those equity dimensions, including <laughs> the very piece you're talking about. So, those on your, I don't know what campus you're on, um, I do think there are people who will be able to um, direct you very in concrete, with concrete low cost solutions, if not no cost to student solutions, how to, how to get these materials um, in, in the forms that work for your students. Um, yes, I see some nice comments in the chat. Thank you all. I knew this, this community of participants would have better information to say than I do. Um, I'm just looking to see if there are any other questions. And I think we might move along pretty soon. Um, there was a question about the blueprint case studies. They will be, the case studies will be um, made public once we go publish through UT Arlington's uh, press books, MAV, MAV Press. Um, and that's gonna take a few more months. We actually have some real vetting and potential editing that has to happen. Um, you know, we're not, we have a somewhat of a, a curation process as all good OER do. Um, so we are going to make the case studies available, but they're not available yet. So I think when, when these are published, you will um, look, you will learn about it um, in multiple ways. We will use all the OER networks and messaging for uh, to um, get the word out and they will be available on the Dewar's website. Um, and Lisa, thank you uh, for a point. It looks like we may have someone uh, to reach out to at a and College Station uh, that may want to contribute a case study. So that, that'd Lisa, be great. thank you for that. Evelyn, I would, I would also, um, I'd like to connect you with uh, faculty in our College of Business who are, um, are um, in the process of identifying and or using OER. I think when we sort of uh, uh, connect with one another and sort of uh, use the resources, it sort of um, reduces the workload in, in ways that makes adoption of OER uh, more probable. Yes, yes, because I saw some people mention about printing, but if the, the objective is, you know, no cost, then um, I know that uh, some of, one of the challenges I have when we were actually um, still on, on campus is that I teach for Houston Community College in the Northwest campus, and then the students would have to go to the central campus to, to the bookstore to get the book there, you know, but Again, that's that's um, as far as OER. Yeah, uh, you know, I think that maybe working with outside entities like Comcast and AT and T, you know, to then provide, um, you know, um, the, the computer or the uh, internet, um, that might be, you know, something that we can encourage to go on. But I see that uh, Chandra Robertson said there's a session this afternoon with Dr. Kurt Stanberry. Um, with UT uh, downtown, but yes, uh, uh, Dr. Phillips, if you can give me that information, that'll be great too. Yep, there's some good comments in the um, chat. So thanks everyone for jumping in um, and good luck, Evelyn. I think we should move along. So Clarin, if you can Thank go you. to the next slide. Um, and so we, we wanna now just turn to the equity through OER rubric, which really is in some ways the centerpiece of the blueprint. It's the heart of it. It's the application, the map that will guide institutions, we hope, and potentially also like it's really, the rubrics focus largely on individual institutions, but I think systems and allied entities and associations will benefit from the kind of unpacking that takes place in the, in the rubric so that you can think about equity in all the dimensions of OER engagement comprehensively, sustainably, and at scale. Um, and I just wanna sort of reference, you know, I think many of us heard the incredibly passionate, inspiring, um, thoughtful keynote yesterday from Dr. Pollard, and she 
I think in some ways she, that was just such a beautiful synthesis of why we are doing this work and why OER is so critical to advancing equity. Um, and I also just feel like this, at this conference in some ways, we're, you're all the choir, we know that, um, but we, we do, and, and so much of the work that I'm seeing here and that is true and inherent throughout OER engagement is social justice centered and equity informed. But we still don't sometimes name the equity dimensions. We don't define it in the ways that we need to for ourselves and all who we're working with, including our students. And we don't necessarily do the rigorous unpacking, which requires real accountability taking responsibility and attention to, to continuous improvement. So the blueprint and the equity through OER rubric really asks us to name equity early, often, always. Um, so in any case, if we can move to the next slide, I wanna, we wanna focus on, actually go back to the previous slide, sorry. We're gonna cover now when we get to the rubric, we're gonna sort of cover the what, why, who, and how. We're gonna cover the scale of adoption because it is an actual rubric. Um, we're gonna look at the rubric dimensions and we're gonna give you a snapshot of what's in the rubric. We aren't able to make it public yet because it's not complete and we still, as I said, have a lot of vetting to do. So next slide. <clears throat> The, so the equity, it really is, the rubric is a comprehensive self-assessment tool that will guide students, faculty, administrators, and all sorts of academic practitioners and leaders to better understand and act on the equity dimensions of OER. We think this is important. We've already said names, why we why do this, why do this now, but we really feel like this amplification of OER origins and equity and social justice um, is critical. And again, as Clorinda has already said, we equity just doesn't happen by itself. We know this. <laughs> we are all working in higher education. It needs intentionality of purpose. It needs action as well as ideas and theoretical grounding. It certainly needs data. Um, and this is really a rubric designed for all sorts of educators at many levels. I hadn't really thought about actually um, K-12, but this, who knows if this would be useful to some of them, but it's really focused on college, university, new university system educators and students from all spheres of influence. And we really invite everyone in to sort of say, what's your role? Where are you coming from? Um, you all have, a, we all have a responsibility. Um, and I think there's some interesting applications, as I've said, that could work for adjacent organizations and associations in this big OER orbit in which we all work, including the policy dimension. Um, and this is, um, there are multiple ways to engage with this rubric um, and it focuses on evaluating progress and acting on those areas identified as requiring additional um, focus and effort. Um, why don't we move on then to the scale of adoption. Clarinet. <laughs> I think it's there. Oh yeah, I, I think this was you, but I can do it if you want. Oh, yes, please. Okay, I will keep going. Um, so the scale of adoption is, we've actually had big debates. You know, this is, if you've all worked on fabulously diverse voices, committees with diverse voices and perspectives, we've actually had some really fun debates about what this rubric should look like. But our scale of adoption is very traditional in, the, in most ways. We have the not present category, we have the beginning, activity or attention, we have the emerging um, scale of adoption and we have the established. We originally had an advanced and we realized that the established in and of itself is so advanced. If anyone gets to established, kudos to all of you, you're doing phenomenally well. And we also thought about not even having that not present category, but it, it helped establish sort of like a baseline from which, you know, the consideration of equity dimensions in certain categories would be able to, um, to work. So we, we define our scale of adoption pretty clearly and um, we, it's, it's been, the challenge has been to sort of get the right, um, somebody's the right language uh, in, the, in the boxes of the rubric. So next slide. I can keep going. Keep going. Okay. Uh, so here's the rubric dimensions. We've really got three areas of what we'll call practitioners in some ways or um, areas of responsibility. We've got a section on students and the student section has three distinct categories. The availability of OER, 
the access te to technology piece that Evelyn brought up and student awareness of OER. And so within the rubric there, and we're gonna show you one of those, I think we're showing you the student awareness of OER um, dimensions. And, and so we really unpack that based on the scale of adoption for each of those three areas in terms of students and what we need to be providing students. Then we have a practitioner section that's actually the longest one because we break it down into thinking about instruction and pedagogy from the practitioner perspective, the content, both quality of content and then content across the curriculum because those things are different, we felt, at least when you're thinking about equity. We have an infrastructure section that actually is broken down into staff support needed, course markings, IT support, and bookstores. And again, we sort of just, you'll, you'll see, you're not gonna get the full picture of the rubric. We kind of wish we could, I, I feel a little bad that we can't share that with you because it would be helpful. Um, but we really run, it's, it's a very comprehensive set of um, roles and responsibilities and, and practical oriented dimensions of doing OER engagement. Finally, we have the leadership and accountability section. And this section is divided into two, two areas, ongoing assessment, and continuous improvement. Um, and the ongoing assessment is really in some ways where for many of us, the rubber can meet the road of things like we think we're doing a good job, but we're not actually looking at the quantitative or qualitative data to know that we're doing a job, good job. And this is actually true in everything I work on in higher education actually. Um, but, you know, we, but we know that that assessment piece is hard and you've got to be intentional about it. So we provide some guidance for ways in which to ramp up your um, assessment practice. And then the continuous improvement section is really where we're focused in some ways on leadership roles and their roles in determining um, OER engagement through strategic planning and budgeting, through goal setting around equity, through policy, through staffing, through other in infrastructure dimensions, because the administrators and the leaders control the budgets. Now we're in some level, we're asking everyone who uses this rubric to view themselves as a leader. At the same time, we wanna call out that institutional administrators and leadership at higher levels, those with sort of budget decision-making authority and strategic planning authority um, have huge roles to play. They also have huge roles to play, for example, in setting good instructor incentives and providing for professional development and, and, and uh, sort of creating a culture where faculty tenure and promotion recognition happens with OER engagement. So these are this is a place where we're, you know, these, these two sections are quite big. Um, and so we're, we're feeling like we've, we've sort of broken it all down. Um, you know, if, and I wanna also just say, when we are able to make this public, I think people, we're a little nervous about how comprehensive it's gonna look. We think it's gonna scare people off, but um, we'll sort of talk about this later. To me, okay, good. Let's, let's, let's invite people in and say, equity isn't just some marginalized activity. You hire your diversity, equity, inclusion, one person on your campus and you say you've accomplished it. It's everybody's responsibility. Um, and when, as we develop this rubric, in some ways it, it became more and more complicated, but the complexity of it, I think speaks to the power to really do the hard work around equity that we know we have to do. Um, we, Clorinda, we had another, um, yeah, yeah, let's go right to the um, slide. Okay, so this is the, um, this is the sample draft dimension on student awareness. And I have, we, we <laughs> Clorinda and I added caveat language, sample draft, note, please. The rubric has not yet been finalized and is undergoing review. This is because, we, as I said, and, and regrettably, we can't make it public yet. We, when we put in this proposal, I will say for Open Texas, I think we were hoping we'd be done and we're not quite done. So in any case, this is what it looks like. One, one, one dimension of the rubric, it's the student awareness of OER. Um, so you can see that we sort of define it out. This is actually one that I think will be pretty you know, I think these are good questions to be asking yourselves. These are good um, sort of ways in which you can sort of check yourself and say, okay, are we doing this um, in terms of whether the student aware, the student awareness building of OER is not present, beginning, emerging, or established. And that established, you'll note, um, in some ways, I think most of us are beginning and in, in the beginning and emerging stages. I'm just going to take a stab. Some of you on this in this. Uh, session are probably advanced already or established, um, but the established 
boxes here are going to really um, ask for a pretty comprehensive approach to each dimension and category in the rubric. And that's gonna be hard to do. So, um, but we know that there's lots of kinds of ways that we have to help our students become aware. Um, and actually what's interesting is, so this is the, st the student awareness of OER. It's not the responsibility of students, needless to say. I mean, we want them to be agents of their own um, informed educational pathways, but this is on, you know, making students aware requires institutional units and departments to really take on those roles, whether it's the course schedules, the registrar, the catalog, the bookstore, the libraries, et cetera, the faculty. Um, so this is where you kind of see that um, unpacking of the dimensions of equity across multiple um, in sort of roles and practitioner levels uh, and responsibility levels throughout an institution. You get a sense of it. I'm, I just wanna quickly check the chat. Okay, so no questions yet. Um, uh, Rebecca, I was just going to say, I think one of the things we we um, noticed or we want to move away from is sort of OER happening in isolated pockets, right? Um, where it may be happening in one department on a on a on a campus or uh, or even that it's just happening within academic affairs. So moving it from sort of being in pockets in a, in a uh, context in an organization um, all the way to it's where it's sort of um, organization wide university wide uh, college wide ownership and it's talked about right and that everybody on the campus on the, uh, or in the organization um, when you say oer they know what it is and they know how that how it's being used in that context to advance student success thank you that's great any questions or you know it that people want to pose i invite you to put them in the chat um and again you're just getting that snapshot but you can kind of see how the, the different sections are organized all right yeah so i, I do believe the powerpoint is available already on the website yep yeah it's, it's, there is a handout if you go to the the session details and so when when you think about the rubric dimensions right we talked about um whether it's students uh, practitioners or leadership when you think about those uh sort of rubric dimensions um sort of where has your organization focused i'll put them back up where has your organization focused? I see practitioners. Thank you, Kimberly. I know when we uh, were doing introductions, quite a few people indicated they were novices. Um, where do you, let me ask the question this way. Um, it, so if you're not already engaging uh, in one of these dimensions, where do you think it would be easiest to begin in your context? Rebecca, are you muted? Yeah, I, I'm sorry, I muted myself. Um, yeah, good to see Amy's comment. Um, hello, Amy, nice to have you here. So practitioners, a little leadership. Um, oh, so movement, if you wanna see movement, get the students on board. So maybe the student awareness building has to be, it obviously has to involve students. <laughs> yeah, if you have a student government association of some sort, you, um, you can count on them being invested in this. Um, one of the things I am curious too, in, in relation to sort of the ways in which you're all engaging with OER, um, we sort of asked this question, who else needs to be at the table? Is there, is there an area at which you feel like you will never make progress without X happening or this entity office leader being involved, or maybe it is the student government? Okay, so the faculty buy-in, I'm not surprised to hear that, Chandra, thank you. 
it's funny, faculty are both the, the absolute champions <laughs> of this, and yet there's also a, an, an element in which they're, they're more resistant, some of them. And I, and I would point to uh, the case studies. I think uh, when you read the case studies, uh, for example, the one from uh, the Ohio State uh, uh, racial justice uh, uh, case study, it, it, they had a small, and I mean small, um, incentive program where faculty could apply for, a, you would call it a seed grant of some sort. And uh, it was a minimal cost to the institution and they only awarded a handful of them, but that's one way to get faculty buy-in. And I, Rebecca mentioned that one of the other work groups is looking at um, how to embed um, use of OER sort of in the, the evaluation of faculty as, as a way to uh, acknowledge the work that faculty um, are doing to adopt OER? There's actually very little, um, as far as we know, but in the sort of environmental scan that the um, group working on the tenure and promotion um, guidelines for faculty, there, um, there's very little in the policy space on that we could find for actual policy changes. Uh, BC campus has like a one sentence way to, to make it make policy going up for tenure and promotion include OER, but it's, 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 it doesn't get very specific just because I think the governance aspects of doing this are, are a challenge. I also want to give a shout out to some of the UT system institutions, UT San Antonio, UT Arlington, who are doing, um, have some excellent grant programs that have been a total, you know, change making um, aspects for, for campus engagement. And um, the other thing I'll say is that, you know, we now have a state government that is putting money into, we have policymakers putting money into OER development. Um, we also have the coordinating board. Of course, the, the governor's funding is transmitted through the coordinating board. The coordinating board here has been incredible. They've been an, an amazing partner and champion and guide and help for all of us doing this work in the state of Texas. We are so fortunate to have them. I, may, I think maybe I saw Kyla on here, Kyla Torres. She's, she's just fantastic to work with. So in some ways we have a lot going um, for us in Texas in ways to engage. Um, okay, any other, good, good to see Kyla. Um, we should, should we move along? And I, again, we'll keep keep putting questions in there. Um, Corinda, I feel like I've been talking a lot lately. Why don't you sort of jump in and then um, I'll come in too. And we're almost done with this and we're almost out of time, but we just wanted to make some some closing remarks. And, and so, you know, and I, I alluded to this value um, um, at the beginning of the presentation, but as we were engaging this work, um, sort of we did have uh, this great epiphany or greater uh, sort of uh, uh, revelation, if you will, of this epiphany, and that is that quality and equity are intertwined, right? So doing OER with an equity lens is doing OER well. Um, if, if, if you're not um, thinking about quality, um, then you're not really doing um, equity work. So with high levels of quality, integrity, and fidelity, that's what it means to do OER. And in that is the quality piece. And so, um, and, and, we, and, and if, we're thinking of, if we're thinking about marginalized and minoritized groups, um, to give them anything less than a quality um, experience, right, does not uh, achieve equity outcomes. Um, Rebecca, I'm gonna let you wrap this up. Okay, thank you, Corenda. Um, so this, this was actually one of the most exciting, like I call it an epiphany, maybe the rest of you are already there, but I just feel like we, I have said for decades that, um, that equity and quality are constituent components of one another. And in all, and I've been at this work for a while, I'm getting old, but I, in all these years, I've never seen such a beautiful representation of that statement than our rubric. Because as you go through the dimensions, and again, this is hard work. This is, it, it is a holistic um, approach to thinking about equity and quality in as, you know, as being driven by OER. Um, but if you can get to some, even some engage with some of these dimensions, evaluating where action and attention are absent is really a necessary first step to being intentional, equity-minded, to taking action and making progress. Um, and then I, you know, we've said that, I mean, you, you can't see the whole thing, but we are, we're aware that this, this tool will have some 
um, in, in its comprehensiveness, it could be um, intimidating to some. But as I, as I started to say earlier, we really have to, I think, resist and refute the low expectations that equity cannot be measured and assessed beyond student success outcomes. We know we have to disaggregate data, but we can be disaggregating data across so many other dimensions of the work that we're doing and looking at the qualitative and quantitative um, at measurement aspects that we just haven't looked at. Um, so we can't just sort of say declare victory in one aspect of equity and go home. It's just not enough. Um, so, and I actually really believe that after all this time, this is one of the reasons why we have not made more progress in higher education around equity, because we don't take the comprehensive look. We let ourselves off the hook too easily. And I, when I say we, pardon me, I shouldn't, it's me, I guess. Um, but, you know, I, I want to be a little careful about who I'm including the we. But I do think, you know, there's so much extraordinary work going on by all of you in this arena, equity and OER, and yet, um, we have made some limited progress, and I think that it's because we haven't engaged all the, the stakeholders we need to, including leadership at the very top, faculty in their classrooms, and so many other practitioners across our institutions. So I think we're out of time. Um, I want to thank all of you so much for being here, and I know you're, it sounds like there's some eagerness to see this tool, and we will work to get it and make it open in public in the next couple of months. Thank you. Dr. Karoff and Dr. Phillips, thank you so much for sharing what is some really significant work that you've been doing with Doers 3 to support equity. And I'd also like to thank our captioner today and all of our attendees for joining us. I hope everyone enjoys the rest of the conference. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Judith. Thank you, Judith.